One day there'll be no more waiting left for our souls. One day there'll be no more children longing for home. One day when the kingdom comes right here where we stand, we will see the promised land. One day there'll be no more lives taken too soon. One day there'll be no more need for a hospital. One day every tear that falls will be wiped by His hand, and we will see the promised land. Skin won't cause a divide. One day we'll be family standing hand in hand, and we will see the promised land. You know, as a Christian, as an American, as a citizen of the world even, you know, I just got to believe that all of us are wanting to see that in our land and looking forward to that. And we may ultimately have to wait till the Lord's return and he ushers his, in his kingdom uh, to see all of that. I believe that right here and on this earth, we need to be doing everything we can to see that kind of peace and that kind of day come. And as we begin a new series today, uh, on the, and it's called David, Lessons of a King, uh, I think there's so much here that you're going to see that what we can do today and lessons we can learn from this Old Testament uh, uh, character that we can do today will make a real difference. And when I said that title, David, Lessons of a King, I, I don't know what you thought of. Probably some of you thought of, the only thing you think of when you think of David is David and Goliath. Or you think, maybe you think, oh, haven't we did sermon series and had lessons on David before? And that's true. But my hope is that we're going to see some lessons from David's life. It's not so much to learn about David, but to learn from David. Uh, lessons that we can learn from a man who had a tremendous successes and, and very high pro profile failures. Uh, unbelievable commitment to God and then to be able to fail so miserably before God. Uh, David's life, to me, it can be very confusing to see the highs and lows and the extremes of his life. But there was one constant in David's life, and that was he, is what the Bible says, what God says, is that he was a man after God's own heart. 
And that was the one constant in his life from the time he was a, a shepherd boy all the way to a reigning king. Now we're going to jump into this story of the life of David in 1 Samuel chapter 16 with verse 1. Verse 1 says this, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Now Samuel, to kind of set some context here, Samuel was the prophet. He was the spiritual leader of Israel. He was the spokesman for God. He was kind of even like the chief justice. He was so respected in all of Israel. And God had years earlier instructed Samuel to anoint Saul, to, to pick Saul out of the group to be the king. So he had some skin in the game. This was a very difficult thing for, Saul, for Samuel to do, to go and pick out a new king. And that's why uh, it's recorded the way it is. Saul seemed like the obvious choice those many years ago. He was very impressive. He was a, a man that stood tall among all other men. And it just seemed like he would be the man for the job. But the power of the fame, of the, the success that he had, it, it ruined him. Uh, he, he became arrogant. He became power hungry. He became very ruthless. He became paranoid and unpredictable. And a good illustration of this is found right in the next two verses in 1 Samuel 16, verses 2 and 3. It says, But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. In verse 3 it says, Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Now just on a side note that jumps off the pages at me here, is I just want to ask this question. If you are a leader in any sense, any sense of the word, where it be at work, in your home, uh, on the ball field, uh, uh, in your church, wherever. Let me ask you something. Are you paranoid? Are you sensitive or an insecure? If you are, let me tell you, it affects everyone around you. It affects their lives. Saul's problems affected Samuel. He had a fear because of how he knew Saul was as a leader. When the people, if you read on, when the people saw Samuel coming to Bethlehem, you know what it says they did? They were afraid and they said, have you come in peace? And it doesn't tell us, but I believe it's simply because of the kind of leader Saul had been. And people didn't know how he was going to react to situations. So when Samuel shows up, they didn't know whether to be happy or sad when he showed up. Hey, I just want to say to you, the way we act especially if we're in any kind of leadership, leadership position, affects the people around us. Can we, we can make people very secure, or we can make them very edgy. And that's something to think about uh, as you're going through this today. And that's going, Samuel invites the elders of Bethlehem, says to come to the sacrifice, and he invites Jesse and his sons to the sacrifice. And this is what happens in verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Samuel repeats this seven times going through seven sons of Jesse. And each one he thought, well, this will be the one that God has chosen. But God says, nope, he's not the one. And he goes through this here uh, and, uh, and goes through it seven times. And we see that Saul suffers from the same flaw that many of us, maybe all of us do. And as that is how we judge people, how we make judgments about people. And many times it's based on appearance or just how we feel or what we like or dislike. Is this a lesson that we need to learn today that we see going on in our country? That how we judge people based on appearance or money or the shirt that they wear or whatever it is? 
You see, as we grow and grow as a Christian, and as we grow hopefully to be more God-like, this should be less and less of a problem. The external things as we begin to look more and more at the heart of things. Mac Brown, who is presently the coach of, at the uni- football coach at the University of North Carolina, tells that when he was the head coach at, at Texas, and he had an incoming freshman who was a very talented football player running back named Ricky Williams. And Ricky Williams at that time, uh, it's not so much a shock today, but then he had very long dreadlocks. And Mac Brown told him, he said, Ricky, you're probably not going to win the Heisman Trophy, which is the highest award a college football player can win. He says, you're probably not going to win the Heisman if you have those dreads. And Ricky Williams, a freshman in college, looked at this much older man and says, I am going to win it because I'm the most talented football player in the nation, not because of the dreads I have on my head. And he says, Coach, you need to look more at the heart and not the head. And Mac Brown, to his credit, said, you know, I listened to that. And I said, you know, Ricky's right. And that began a journey of his life where he's tried to listen and understand people more about what's inside and not just the appearance. You see, none of us are going to be perfect at this, but we are capable of making progress in how we judge people. To do a better job of listening, to looking, to trying to understand people from where they are. God is awesome at this. He's just awesome at it. He doesn't disqualify anyone by their outward characteristics. <clears throat> Joseph was in his 30s when he became second in all the command of Egypt. Moses was 80 when he began to lead the people out of Egypt. Abraham and Sarah were ready for the nursing home when God made them the parents of a nation. Samuel was a young boy when God first called him to be a prophet for him. Esther was a young woman uh, uh, who, when called to save the nation of Israel. Mary was probably something age-wise between a junior high and high school student when Gabriel announced to her that she would be the mother of the Savior of the world. We will never be as good as God in making these type of choices, but we can do better. Samuel says this is, it says to Jesse, he says, this all your sons? And Jesse says, well, no, uh, being guilty of the same thing Samuel did. says, well, I've got one more, the youngest son, but he's out taking care of the sheep. And Samuel says, send for him and bring him to me. And he brings him in from tending the sheep. And verses 12 and 13 of chapter 16 says this. <clears throat> so he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. Verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And Samuel went back to Ramah. If you'll think about that for just a minute. This is the king of Israel being anointed by the prophet of Israel. And it almost seems anticlimactic. I mean, you know, it took some time for them to go find David and bring him in. There weren't cell phones that called. They had to go find him in the fields. They brought him back. I've got the feeling that probably a lot of the people of Bethlehem, the leaders, had already left because it had stretched out so long. And it was kind of anticlimactic. There was not trumpets. There was not... An angel's announcement from God. And it says that when it was over with, Samuel went back to where he came from. And and by from other verses, we see that David went back to tending the sheep. Josephus, a Jewish historian and scholar, says that Samuel whispered in David's ear when he anointed him and said, You will be the next king. Now, we do not know if that's true or not, if that's just legend, but It's not reported in the Bible. But we do know this. The Spirit of the Lord was on David from that moment forward. From that moment forward, the Spirit of God was active in his life. 
And although it was not a perfect life, he wasn't a perfect man, he wasn't a perfect king, wasn't a perfect husband or father, God chose the right man because he was a man after God's own heart. Now what I want to do here for the few minutes we have left is I just want to point out some of the lessons that I think we can learn about listening to God and being ready for God when he calls us. First one is this. God calls us to secular and spiritual tasks both. Usually when people think of when you say God's calling us or God's calling, we think only of the spiritual things like going in the mission field or becoming a preacher. But to do that is to limit God and how he works in our lives. Samuel anointed David to be king, but he continued to work as a shepherd first. He was a musician for the king. He was a soldier. And then he lived many years as a fugitive of the law before he became king. Listen to this quote from the book, Your Work Matters to God. Millions go to work without seeing the slightest connection between what they do all day and what they think God wants done in the world. But your work matters deeply to God. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 is one of my favorite verses. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Look, and please listen close. I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying here. The sins and the turmoil of our nation that have been so evident in the last few weeks. The turmoil and hate and violence is not going to be fixed by a speech by any person. It's not going to be corrected by a rally, even a movement, a president, an athlete who speaks out, not the police. And I'm not discounting the value of every one of those and the efforts of every one of these people. But real healing will come to our land when millions upon millions upon millions of individual actions by people who have listened to the call of God and say to themselves and make the commitment that I can make the place that I live a better world, that I can show the love of God to people everywhere. They're seeing that whatever they're called to do is a calling from God. It's not just a job that you go to, but a a desire that we want to see the kingdom of God flourish here on this earth. That's when change will really come. The second thing I think we learn from David is this. Be ready. Be ready when he calls. God calls, God's call or his opportunities usually come unexpectedly. The people weren't expecting Samuel to show up in Bethlehem that day. Jesse wasn't expecting that his youngest son needed to be present at this sacrifice. And David didn't expect to become a king while working as a shepherd. Jackie Robinson was the first black uh, major league baseball player to ever play uh, in the major leagues. And while he was breaking that color barrier, he faced what you can imagine was so many, uh, some some of the things that were thrown at him verbally and physically from fans. But in one game in particular, playing before his home crowd uh, in Brooklyn in 1947, playing second base, Jackie Robinson committed an er an error. And the people began to boo and say all kinds of terrible things. And Jackie Robinson, all he could do was hang his head standing there at second base. The shortstop for the Brooklyn Dodgers at that time was a man named Pee Wee Reese. A white man, born and raised in the South. And Pee Wee Reese called time out and walked from shortstop over to second base and stood beside Jackie Robinson and then did this. He put his arm around him and faced the crowd. And it said that the crowd became silent 
as they stood there for what seemed like a long time to Jackie Robinson and the crowd. Jackie Robinson is credited as saying, that arm around my shoulder saved my career that day. It was just a baseball game. It was just another day at work or another day at school or another shopping trip to Walmart. It was just another day of vacation at the beach. But if we only see it as just another day, <clears throat> we will not be expecting God to use us. And we most likely will not hear the call, see the opportunity, and it will be a day wasted. Third thing is this. God calls the ordinary. God calls the ordinary. We've already pointed out and noted that David wasn't even on the list that day of either his father or from Samuel. But if you looked at the list of disciples that Jesus chose, when you go through that list, they were none important, none famous, none powerful, none rich. Did you notice the town that Jesus was born in? Bethlehem, a small, small town. Did you see the mother that God chose to be the mother of the Savior of the world, Mary? Sure, there was an angel, Gabriel, who came and announced that day that she would be uh, with child and, and bring Jesus into the world, but no one else saw that angel. Even when Jesus rose from the dead, <clears throat> he did it about as ordinary or as quietly as you possibly could. He didn't split the sky. He didn't appear first in Jerusalem for everybody to see. He simply rose from the dead. And angels waited till the women came to the tomb. And that's when they announced that Jesus had risen from the dead. God being so powerful and awesome so many times chooses in the, to work in the ordinary person in ordinary ways to accomplish extraordinary things. Do not ever excuse yourself because you're ordinary. Do not ever demean yourself for being an ordinary person, for not being of some spectacular job or, or to be uh, wealthy or to have a, a great heritage. Never judge yourself or discount yourself because of outside factors like money, appearance, heritage, talents, job or, or job you possess. I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 26. It sounds like a cut, but it isn't. He says, brothers, <clears throat> think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Paul isn't cutting them down, but he just basically says, look at you. God is doing extraordinary things in this world and in your life, not because of how great you are, but because of who you are in His sight. God calls us no matter who we are. And I want to close with this last one here that I think is the most important. And that's simply to accept the call. Accept the call. David was anointed that day, and we don't even know if, if, if Samuel whispered in his ear, you will be the next king. His family apparently didn't know or didn't accept it, believe it, or whatever you want to say, because as we read through these chapters, we'll see that they didn't treat David in any special way. How many times in the years to come would David have the opportunity to question God, to question what he really called by God? But he did accept the call, and it just... Let that sink in. David accepted the call from God. I was reading an article this week about Father's Day, trying to get ready for that uh, coming up in a few weeks. And uh, one author wrote this. He said, every day, and, and since he's talking about fathers, he says this. He says, every day, fathers get in their cars and leave work and choose to come home and be a father. Day after day after day, but some don't. Let that sink in a minute. 
We're not saying they're noble for doing that, but it says every day people choose to come home, to, be, to put on the hat of being a, a husband, a father. And they do it over and over. Some don't. Moms, every day, choose to show up and be a mother to their children, while some don't. To be a wife to their husband, while others just check out. God is calling us every day to accept the call, to be that mom, that dad, that husband, that wife, to be that good friend, to be that student that people can look to and look up to and know that they're going to get a little taste of God whenever they're around you. Every day you get to make the decision whether you will accept the call to be a, at work to be a positive person or you can choose to be a complainer. You can be positive or you can be negative. You can be a problem causer or you can be a problem solver. You can be a giver of hope. You can be a lover of God. Or you can choose not to be. And possibly the greatest lesson is simply this. Accept the call. Day after day after day. Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Accept the call. Max Licato wrote a book many years ago entitled, When God Whispers Your Name. And maybe you're listening <clears throat> for trumpets. Maybe you're waiting for trumpets and an announcement from God. Maybe you're waiting for bright lights or lightning or thunder in the sky. But I'm afraid if you're waiting for all of that, you'll miss God whispering the call to serve Him each and every day. And then over and over again, when you least expect it, God will whisper again, come follow me. Keep up the good fight. Will you love a little more? Will you give a little more? <clears throat> will you show up one more day? And I just want to ask today, are you listening? Are you listening for God's voice through his word, through his Holy Spirit, through the opportunities of the day? And as always, and even though I know we're separated by a lot of things right now, that call of God is still there and present every single moment of every day. And I pray that you will not let this moment go by without heeding the call of God. You know, we've said every week that we try to come and take the Lord's Supper together no matter where we are. And uh, the news is when it's been dominated and, uh, so much by things opening up and getting out getting back in, and, and we've begun to have uh, our worship services again here uh, in our buildings. But some are not comfortable with that yet. I get it. I understand it. I really do. But I want you to know this. There should never be a time that you do not feel welcome, that you do not feel comfortable coming to the Lord's table. And I pray each and every week, no matter whether you're alone or you're with family members or friends or whatever it is, you choose to come to the Lord's table because He has invited you there. You are welcome there. And no matter what the situation is, you can be comfortable there. So I'm going to just say a prayer for us right now. <clears throat> and at your time and at your, the way you can in your homes, You'll come around the Lord's table. Let's pray together. <clears throat> God, thank you so much that you make us welcome, that you make us comfortable at your Lord's table, <clears throat> no matter where we are. And as we partake of this bread and as this juice, I pray we're just grateful, we're encouraged, we're hopeful as we look for your return. Thank you so much for loving us, living for us, dying for us, and then rising again. And we look forward to someday being with you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to say to all of you, thank you for joining us today. 
God bless you. We love you.